five people who are executed but found innocent. Everyone is presumed innocent until proven guilty, but sometimes even the most sophisticated criminal justice systems fail us. The people on this list suffered because of this and paid for it with their lives. These are five people who were executed but then found innocent. Number five, Cameron Willingham. It was December 23, 1991, just two days before Christmas, when the Willingham's family home in Corsicana, Texas, burned down. Cameron Willingham escaped from the fiery home with singed hair all over his body and a bad burn on his shoulders. Unfortunately, though, his two-year-old daughter Amber and his one-year-old twins, Carmen and Cameron, all perished in the fire. His wife Stacy was out shopping for Christmas presents at the time when the unfortunate incident occurred. Fire investigators concluded the flames had been increased by some type of liquid accelerant. They said they discovered puddle-shaped char patterns on the floor, as well as multiple points of origins, leading them to believe the fire was started on purpose. Investigators also said there were accelerants found near the front door area. Neighbors Brandis and Diane Barbie said they urged Willingham to go back inside the house to rescue his daughters, but according to them, he not once attempted to go back inside. Officers were also suspicious that days after the fire, Willingham returned to the home with friends and family trying to recover personal property, which they claimed was odd behavior. Shortly after this, Willingham was detained and charged with possible arson. Although investigators couldn't agree on a motive, they pointed at several possible reasons. First, that he had burned the house to kill the children. Prosecutors claimed setting the house on fire was Willingham's third effort in trying to get rid of his children and that he had tried to have them aborted during pregnancy, even though no police reports or medical evidence supported this. Furthermore, prosecutors argued he was a serial wife abuser and sociopath. Psychiatrist James Grigson also testified stating Willingham's tattoo of a skull and serpent indicated he fit the profile of a sociopath. Even more, that his posters of Iron Maiden and Led Zeppelin were signs of his cultive-type personality. During trial on January 8, 1992, Willingham was offered a life term in exchange for a guilty plea, but he turned it down, insisting he was innocent. Prosecutors argued Willingham set his house on fire by pouring lighter fluid as he exited the home, causing him to have only superficial burns. But later, investigators said his burns and injuries, while they look minor, are consistent with someone who was inside the home prior to flashover point, which is before the house suddenly burns down. But it was too late and the man was sentenced to death. He tried for multiple appeals without success. Willingham was then executed via lethal injection on February 17, 2004. After his death, people started to come forward saying they were convinced that State Deputy Fire Marshal Manuel Vasquez had relied on junk science to examine the evidence and proclaim arson in the case. The evidence was then tested and re-examined by multiple professional fire experts, all of which proclaimed the fire didn't have evidence of arson. Well-known fire investigator Gerald Hurst even recreated all the scenarios and experiments point by point, concluding there was no arson at all. He submitted his report to Governor Rick Perry's office in an appeal for clemency for Willingham but Perry refused, stating Willingham was a monster. Even more investigations were done the years after Willingham's execution, and it all pointed to evidence that he was likely innocent all along, something which he said he was all the way up until his death. Number 4. Robert Cantu Robert Cantu, also known as Reuben, lived a tough life. At the age of 14, his parents split up, and he ended up living with his father in a crime-laden neighborhood south of San Antonio, Texas. The father and son lived in a trailer, and Reuben got involved with the local gang named the Grey Eagles. The following year, he became a head of their theft ring, stealing cars and spending his time driving them to Mexico in exchange for cash. Even though he was stealing, Cantu remained free, that is, until November of 1984. According to trial records, on the 8th of November of that year, at around 11.30 p.m., Reuben, who was 17 at the time, and 15-year-old David Garza broke into a vacant home that was under construction. 
Inside were construction workers, 25-year-old Pedro Gomez and 19-year-old Juan Moreno. Both were asleep on mattresses laid on the floor, supposedly there guarding the area from burglars. The men were in their work clothes and had pockets filled with cash earnings. Cantu and Garza had a rifle with them and threatened the two men, demanding their wristwatches and cash. But one of the workers, Gomez, tried to retrieve a pistol that was hidden close by, and the robbers opened fire. Gomez was shot more than nine times and died instantly. Then the men turned to Moreno and also shot him several times before leaving the scene. However, Moreno miraculously survived his injuries despite losing one lung, a kidney, and a portion of his stomach. There were no leads for the murder and robbery, but soon rumors were spread and passed along the halls of South San Antonio High School where Cantu had studied and soon he was being linked to the crime. During investigations, police repeatedly questioned the surviving victim about the shooting. In the first three attempts, he was unable to identify Cantu as a suspect, and the case then went cold. Then Cantu got involved in a barroom shooting with a plainclothes officer, whom he claimed threatened him by showing off his gun. Shots were fired between Officer Joe De La Luz and Ruben. Ruben said he fired back in self-defense, but according to the officer, he was shot by him without any provocation. Since there was no hard evidence in the crime against Cantu and the officer shooting, the murder charge from the construction site against him was reopened. Victim Juan Moreno was interviewed again, and this time, he was brought to the police station and he finally identified Ruben as the killer. Cantu was arrested and sentenced to death, but he maintained his innocence up until the day of his death via lethal injection on August 24, 1993. Years after the killing, Moreno recanted his statement and said it wasn't Cantu with Garza that night. Even Garza himself said it was another childhood friend with him during the robbery. The victim, Moreno, said he was pressured to identify it was Cantu who shot him. Many believe Ruben was wrongfully convicted and killed for a crime he didn't commit. It's believed police wanted to pin the murder on him because he had shot Officer De La Luz. Even District Attorney Sam Millsap, a once proponent for the death penalty, expressed his remorse and said it was likely not Ruben who committed the crime. Number 3. Troy Davis Supported by celebrities, politicians, and even a former FBI director, Troy Davis was convicted and executed for killing off-duty police officer Mark McPhail in Savannah, Georgia. It happened on the evening of August 18, 1989, when Davis attended a pool party with his friend Daryl Collins. As the two left, a drive-by shooting took place on a group of teens. One victim, Michael Cooper, was shot in the jaw. Later that night, Davis and Collins headed to a Burger King parking lot close to a pool hall they visited after the party. Once there, they spotted Sylvester Red Coles fighting with a homeless man over alcohol. Later on, the homeless victim, who was named Young, was pistol whipped, but he couldn't tell who attacked him. At around 1.15 a.m. on August 19th, a security guard from the Burger King and off-duty police officer Mark McPhail tried to intervene during the pistol whipping incident, but he was shot twice, one bullet going through his heart and the other his face, killing him instantly. He didn't even have a chance to draw his own gun. 38 caliber shell casings and bullets were found on the scene. Those who saw the incident said a man in a white shirt was the one who attacked Young as well as the officer. Later that day, Coles told Savannah police that Davis had a 38 caliber pistol and that it was him who committed the crime. The same night of the shooting, Davis actually headed to Atlanta with his sister, which made him look guilty. The following morning, police searched the Davis home but couldn't find any weapon. By August 23rd of 89, Davis arrived back in Savannah and turned himself over to authorities. He was instantly charged with murder for the death of McPhail even though no murder weapon was recovered and there wasn't direct evidence linking him to the killing. On the other hand, Coles told police he lost his 38 caliber weapon he had registered before it could be tested. In November of 89, Davis was charged with murder, the assault of Young, and the shooting of Michael Cooper, the teen who was injured during that drive-by. Davis entered a not guilty plea, and during trial, multiple witnesses were called for the prosecution, as well as the defense, 
each adding layers to the story. But in the end, the jury took only two hours to proclaim Davis guilty, and he was subsequently sentenced to death. Davis filed multiple appeals, and seven of the initial prosecution witness testimonies even recanted or changed their story over time. They stated they received pressure from police to point out Davis as the murderer. And at least three witnesses gave signed affidavits that Coles had admitted to committing the murder instead. Despite multiple appeals and at least three execution stays issued, on September 21, 2011, Troy Davis was executed via lethal injection. In his last words, he proclaimed his innocence, addressing the McPhail family, his family members, and those about to kill him. He was declared dead at 11.08 p.m., and his death became the second most talked about subject on Twitter after 9-11 that year. Number 2. Alexander Kravchenko On December 24, 1978, nine-year-old Yelena Zakhodnova's body was found dumped close to a bridge overlooking the Grushevka River in Russia. A young girl had been raped, strangled, and then stabbed three times. Despite other evidence pointing at another suspect, police for some reason zeroed in on Alexander Kravchenko as the killer. Kravchenko had once served prison time as a teenager when he raped and murdered another young girl, and even though he had an airtight alibi on the day of the murder, he was with his wife and his wife's friend at home, police still pointed the finger at him. Authorities threatened his wife and her friend to claim Kravchenko was not at home with them and instead returned later that evening. Now confronted with this testimony and intense interrogation, Kravchenko eventually confessed to the killing of the young girl. He was tried for murder the following year in 1979, where he retracted his confession and proclaimed his innocence, pointing out that his confession was done under extreme duress. His sentence was initially 15 years behind bars, which was the maximum during that time. However, under pressure from the victim's relatives, he was retried and sentenced to death in July of 83. It would take years before the truth would come out when it was revealed that Kravchenko wasn't the culprit at all. In fact, the reality was that Yelena was the first victim of the infamous Russian serial killer, Andrei Chikatilo. Known as the Butcher of Rostov, it was Chikatilo that lured the young girl into an old house, raped, and then killed her. In fact, various pieces of evidence at the crime scene that were found would have led police to Chikatilo had it been investigated fully. Blood spots were in the house Chikatilo purchased, and neighbors saw him there on December 22nd. Furthermore, a witness came forward with a detailed description of the suspect that looked like Chikatilo speaking with the girl at a bus stop. Andre Chikatilo went on to sexually assault, mutilate, and murder 52 women and children between 1978 and 1990. Although it's believed he killed as many as 57 victims, he was executed in February of 1994. As for Alexander Kravchenko, he was posthumously pardoned and cleared of any wrongdoing in December of 1990, but of course, that was all a little too late. Number 1. Johnny Garrett It was October 31, 1981, when 76-year-old nun, Sister Tadea Benz, was brutally raped and murdered inside the St. Francis Convent in Armarillo, Texas. When the sisters at the convent found Sister Benz's body, they didn't initially report the death, thinking she fell out of her bed and died despite the severe injuries she suffered. It would take days before police were able to examine the body and determine foul play was in fact involved. Days after the incident, a local psychic known as Inez approached police claiming that she had a vision on who killed the nun. She then led them to the front door of 17-year-old Johnny Garrett. See, Garrett lived right across the street from the convent and became the prime and only suspect immediately. Then there were fingerprints found inside the convent that matched those of Garrett. He admitted to being inside there several times, stealing items, but said he didn't kill the nun. But police insisted that he was guilty and had actually confessed to the crime, even if Garrett denied this and refused to sign the typed-up confession. When he was placed in prison, a jailhouse informant claimed he had admitted to the murder. Curiously, despite having semen evidence that could have possibly proved or convict the suspect without a doubt, 
The evidence was disposed of because the state pathologist said no one asked him to keep it. Other possible evidence that pointed away from Garrett existed. This included several foreign prints not from Garrett. Hairs were also found, including a bloody v-neck shirt, athletic socks, shoe prints, and blood on the exit door. Another boy even corroborated Garrett's testimony that they had gone inside the convent two days before the murder to steal something, hence the explanation for the fingerprints. But despite this, Johnny Garrett was still convicted by a jury to death. Police also failed to link the murder of Sister Tadea Benz with a previous killing months before. This was the rape and murder of 77-year-old Narni Bryson. Furthermore, no evidence was made to use this case to help exonerate or cast doubt on Garrett's innocence by his lawyers. Johnny was eventually executed on February 11, 1992. His last words included thanking his family and telling everyone who was about to kill him that they could kiss his ass. It said a longer letter was created by Garrett cursing those involved in proclaiming him guilty. In 2004, positive DNA evidence pointed to a man named Leoncio Ruda as the person who killed Narni Bryson, and by Ruda's confession, a nun as well. Ruda is a Hispanic immigrant with matching features witnesses reported seeing on the night of the murder. Curiously, Ruda said he was urged to kill and rape the woman by his friend Fernando Flores. Flores was actually the first suspect in the murder of Sister Benz, but police never bothered to link him further either, pursuing Garrett based on a psychic's recommendation. So there were five people who were executed but found innocent. People are inherently flawed and therefore so is our justice system. While many of these men are far from saints, there's no denying they shouldn't have been killed for crimes they never even committed. If you like this video, then please subscribe to our channel because each week we have new videos to show you on Wednesdays and Saturdays. We appreciate you tuning in. Hit that notification bell and I'll see you in the next one.